The importance of outreach into the community is that it shows who Christ is through our community here at New Life, reaching out into the neighboring community and building relationships, building bridges. I believe that that's how people are going to see who Christ is. By us reaching out in tangible ways, over time developing relationship and consistency, they'll see who Christ is and be drawn to Him through us reaching out into the community. We were able to provide meals and groceries to supplement those lunches for families who were really struggling during the shutdown. We were able to, in October of 2019, have our first Trunks of Treats event, which was a huge success. We had a thousand people come through our parking lot. We were able to meet some of the surrounding neighborhood and get to know them. And we were able to have a fun, safe environment for families to come out and have a great time together. This summer, we're able to reach out to the community through worship in the park. We had an extended worship concert in the park and we're able to be out in the park just down the road and get to meet some of our neighbors. And some of them just got to hear us worshiping there in the park the impact project. We've done three or four impact projects with them. And these are projects where we get to go to somebody's home and provide a tangible need for them, like a roof or a handicapped ramp. We provide the volunteers and the impact project provides the structure and the plan. And we show up with a bunch of volunteers and are able to bless someone. Laundry Love is a national organization and we started about six months ago partnering with them, then we have a location right here in Endicott that we go to monthly to provide the resources for people to do their laundry. It's been an amazing experience. Over time, they've watched our volunteers and gotten to know them and realized that they just wanna help, that they just wanna be there and provide this resource for the community. Through the Whispers production, the four different shows, the Dramatic Arts program at New Life and the Celebrate Recovery program at New Life, we're able to partner together to provide an incredible show that was very impactful for many people. It portrayed the lives of people struggling with addiction and deep, deep hurts and how God came in and brought hope and healing we are one of many thousands of locations that have a Celebrate Recovery program. And this is for any hurt, habit, or hang up that someone is struggling with. The CR team was able to partner with the drama team as they did the show. The CR team was able to be there for people, give them resources, provide Bibles and things like that, and talk to people as they came out of the show. And it was an amazing experience to watch the different teams at New Life come together to make that production happen. I've watched over the last year as our community here at New Life and their walk with God has grown deeper and they have grown more passionate about getting out and telling other people about how much he loves them and going out into the community and sharing that with others in such a genuine loving way has been amazing to see. You think all of these outreach opportunities that we get to do are worth doing? I do. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we look to your word, I pray that you will open our hearts and open our minds. We come here today admitting our need for you, and I pray that you will transform us by how we encounter you through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. October of 2002, Kelsey and I took the last $30 that we had and we sat in the Wendy's on Washington Avenue because we were hurting inside so bad we didn't think we were ready to go pick up the kids yet. We had just come from the attorney's office where we had hoped to close on the house that we wanted to keep 
but had to sell. I had told Kelsey when we moved in, and I was so proud of the fact that we were able to scrum up enough money to put a down payment on a house with a couple little acres. I said, when I get older and I kick the bucket, I want you to bury me under that tree. I don't think they let you do that, but that's what I said. I'll save you all the gory details, but what happened is that a series of things didn't go our way. And the kicker is that I'm in my mind thinking, you know, Lord, we're literally putting everything on the line for you. We're making all of these sacrifices so that we can obey you and do what you said. And I didn't understand why when I did what God told me to do, when I followed him into ministry, when I gave up my full-time ministry job in order to start a new church and had to work another job outside of the church, when we did this and we did that and we gave big and we sacrificed. I didn't have any place to put the idea that things could somehow go sideways. But have you ever had a season in your life where it's not just one thing, you could deal with one thing? It's not just two things. It's not just a financial thing, it's a relational thing. It's not just this, it's that too. And then once you kind of fall down the flight of stairs and a bunch of bad things happen, and then like the bottom drops out of the bottom, have you ever sat there stunned, not being able to make words or make sense of how this works with your faith? That's where we were that day. As a young man, I thought I had a deal with God. I thought that if I give him every part of my life, and if I hold nothing back, if I open up his word and then, then do everything I could possibly do to respond to what I see, and then I pray and the Lord says, do this, and I actually do that, then I thought it was then his job to make everything work out. I, I thought that it's my job to obey God and if I do, then it's his job to make it all good. If you think that's how this whole God thing works, let me tear that down right now. Because that's not the deal. Our God is not looking to negotiate a contract with you. He wants to be God. And if you're looking for that... There's a big difference between that and what the God of the Bible actually calls you to. I, I thought that if I sacrificed my everything for him, then he would take all of those things in his hands and he would say, aw, thanks, you go ahead and keep that. And here's some more. Turns out that's not how it works. <laughs> in that season of my life, in those years, in the early 2000s, God let or led us through some hard stuff, some things we didn't understand how to deal with. And in that set of years, he broke me of some of the selfish motivations for why I wanted to have a relationship with him, for why I wanted to obey him, for why I wanted to give and be a servant of his. But in those years, as Kelsey and I at a deeper level suffered, and through that suffering understood God's sacrifice for us, God was faithful. And he used our little sacrifice. And he used the sacrifice of the church, the little bitty church that we led, to start to impact the community and to transform us. God calls all of us to sacrifice what's comfortable and what's safe in exchange for what actually grows us. And as we individually learn how to give up what's good for what's great, God grows his kingdom both in us and through us. Think about this. The greatest thing that's ever happened in the history of the world happened through sacrifice. Right? Jesus' death as the perfect son of God in the flesh was the most unjust thing that ever happened. And the crucifixion didn't just happen to Jesus. 
He allowed it to happen. He was in charge the whole time. At any moment, he could have called legions of angels to get him out of that spot. But he didn't. His love for you and for me kept him on that cross. And because he stayed, because he suffered, because he sacrificed, new life is now available to everyone who calls on his name in faith. Friends, that's the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you're here today and you haven't made that good news good news for you, you can place your faith in Jesus right now. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I understand that what you did on the cross is for me. I know that there's all of this garbage in my heart and in my life and I pray that you will forgive me for my sin. I pray that your sacrifice made on the cross won't be for nothing, but you'll make me brand new. And just as you died and you rose, I pray that you'll raise me to new life right now. I want to make you my Lord Jesus, and I pray that you'll teach me how to live. Amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, I want to talk to you after the service. I have a little gift for you, and I would just like to high-five you or fist bump you. Sound good? Okay. Yeah. Cool. So God still does great things through sacrifice, and Jesus calls his followers to lives of sacrifice. In this series, From the Ground Up, we've talked about how God told Abraham a few things. He said, go from your country and your people and your father's household to the land I will show you in Genesis 12. And he did. God had a great big plan in mind. And the beginning of it was that Abraham had to get up from where he was and to go to where God said to go to. Abraham followed God, knowing that God had made him this great promise. The Lord said, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. You will be a blessing, so you're blessed to be a blessing. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Hold on a second. Um, before I go any further, I need somebody to give me $100. Could somebody please give me a... Hey... Rick, guys, would you, uh, for real? Thanks, dude. Appreciate it, bro. God's blessed me with everything I have. God has blessed me with everything I have, Rick says. Cool. Rick just gave me, hey, it's a nice crisp C note. Thank you, dude. Appreciate it. All right. You guys should try that sometime. <laughs> I don't know if that would work. I was kind of sweating it. Okay. So, but God's promise was slow in coming. So Abraham let God know about it. God was gracious enough to reiterate his promise to Abraham in Genesis chapter 15. Then the word of the Lord came to him. A son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. Abraham was stressing because he didn't have any kids. How could God make his line into a great nation if God wouldn't bless him with children? So in verse 6, God actually believes, uh, Abraham actually believes what God told him. Abraham believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. But as time went by, Abraham and Sarah decided that God's timeline was too slow. Have you ever done that? I have. God promised Abraham that he'd make him into a great nation, but it was taking too long. So Sarah told Abraham, there's an alternative. You go sleep with our slave. And that's how this will come about. Well, that went predictably terrible. <laughs> now look at this. Even though they messed up and tried to force God's will by doing their own thing, again, I've done that too, God still repeated his promise in Genesis chapter 18 that about this time next year, they would have a child. But in Genesis 21, God fulfills his promise. 
Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the very time God had promised him. Look at that. Abraham gave him the name Isaac to the son Sarah bore him. Isaac means the one who laughs. Isn't that a great name? When his son Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him as God commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Sarah said, God has brought me laughter and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. And she added, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. Friends, only God could do that, right? Did you come here with something in your life that you can't do and you know only God can do that? Maybe it's the distance between you and God being closed and Jesus provided for that. Maybe it's the distance between you and somebody you love being closed and this time you just don't know and you know that you can't do it but maybe God can do it. Maybe you're facing a financial mountain and you don't know how God's gonna move that mountain. Maybe you're here and you're just so depressed and discouraged and beaten up and you think, God, how will you ever get me through this season? There is grace from Jesus Christ for you. Now imagine when they received this child, the pure joy of the parents who had been promised of holding their newborn son. This right here is the child of the promise. God says he's going to make a great nation from this little baby. They're so happy. In Genesis 22, though, the plot thickens. Verse 1, sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he said. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. On the way to God's greatest promises in your life being fulfilled, you will be tested. Parents, you have hopes and dreams for your children? You think they're just going to skate into adulthood as Jesus-loving people without any battles in prayer, without any battles for them? Husbands and wives, do you have to fight for God's best for your marriage? Singles, do you have to fight for your friendships and for God's preferred future for you? Absolutely. Let's look at what Abram did. Verse three, early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. It's not enough for you to sit and wait for God to do something. God calls you to get up from where you are and to go. If you don't know how God's going to solve the big thing in your life, move in response to God in the little thing. If you know one tiny thing that God said, get up and do it, and God will get you in motion in the direction of his promise. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. This is a man of faith. God's told him what to do, and he tells his servants, knowing that God said, go sacrifice your son, we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, uh, Dad, 
Yes, my son Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. The two of them went on together. Some of you are here, and you might not even have realized it until this moment. You're waiting for so long on God's promise, and God delivered his promise. You doubted along the way, and you messed up and tried to force his will, and still, he was so gracious. You've still seen him provide, and you've seen God be faithful. You celebrated, and then God's like, okay, now I want you to take this incredible blessing, and I want you to give it up. I want you to sacrifice the very things that you were hoping for. God does this for a reason, and it's not to destroy us. It's to form us and to fashion our faith. We have to answer the question, do we want to obey God even more than we want to enjoy his blessings? What's greater in your life, the blessings or the blesser? God calls believers to sacrifice what's good, the blessings, for what's great, him. If you're not familiar with this story about Abraham and Isaac going up the mountain, don't worry, he did not harm his son. God prevented it. The willingness was there, but God provided a ram for the sacrifice, and this is all a precursor. It's all foreshadowing to what God's gonna do with Christ. But the question in Abraham's life do you trust me, was forever answered. In Romans chapter four, the apostle Paul talks about Abraham's faith. Listen to this. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words, it was credited to him, were written not for him alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness, for us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for us and was raised to life for our justification. Hello, praise God. You know what this means? Yeah, so you know what this means? What Jesus did on the cross, when I place my faith in him, that that was for me, my faith applies Christ's righteousness to me, and I am justified. Justified means that God sees me just as if I'd never sinned. I no longer have that feeling of dread that I have to work off my sin and pay for it because Christ paid what I could not. Abraham was willing to sacrifice the child of the promise because he trusted the God of the promise. He was fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. Are you? In your life, in the greatest hopes and dreams that you have, in all the ways that God's called you to obey him, in all the ways that God has said, I'm gonna bless you, and now I'm gonna call you to be a blessing and to sacrifice. Are you fully persuaded that God has the power to do what he has promised? Will you sacrifice what's good for what's great? Are you pursuing the blessings of God more than you're pursuing obedience to God? 
You know, if God calls, not if, when God calls us to sacrifice, when God calls us to risk for him, we find out really quick if safety and stability or God's blessings have become our God. I know people who have taken pay cuts for the joy of serving Jesus. I know people who right now are selling their possessions for the joy of being generous. If you, like Abraham and like Jesus, are willing to trust God, he will use your faith. I've been there. I've done this. God's taught me how to put everything in his hands. It's been a learning experience. But now, as God blesses me, I hold his blessings loosely. I literally thought I was going to live in the first home we bought until I died. I thought the church that Kelsey and I started in the early 2000s was going to be this incredible blessing for so many people, and we had to shut it down. Those things, those lessons, almost killed me. But God didn't do it to harm me. He did it for my good, to teach me that I need to be attached. I need to put my faith in the blesser, not the blessing. The glorious future that God is calling you to cannot be obtained without significant sacrifice. And in the same way, the future that God has in mind for new life will not become a reality without all of us sacrificing. Kelsey and I are certain that God's prepared us for decades to be part of what he's doing here in the church now. And we really believe that God wants to grow this ministry in the coming years so the people in this area, so starting in the neighborhood and then out to the whole community and then this entire region that's known for being tough soil for the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I believe God wants to change the spiritual temperature of this entire region and he wants to use us to do it. But never in the history of the church has that happened without God's people sacrificing. You know, we've got to start right here and equip this building to reach more people than we currently can. We were talking about it this, this week as Kelsey and I were reading scripture and praying together. You know what she said to me? With all the struggles that this area has had in the last 25 years, our, she said to me, our building can't look like IBM. Chunks of it falling off. This community needs to say, see that we're here, we're committed, and we're invested right here. Our best years are not behind us, they're ahead of us. So Kelsey and I personally, I'll just tell you this because you need to know I'm not asking you to do something I'm not. We're willing to sacrifice for it to happen. Those two buckets, Kelsey and I give 10% of our income, the first and the best of what God blesses us with, and we put that in that first bucket, and that goes towards funding the ministries of the church. And lots of people here at New Life do that. Thank you. We do some other giving, kind of what we call fun giving. But in these next two years, Kelsey and I are putting the next 10% of our income into the project bucket. A double tithe is not going to be comfortable, and it's not going to be easy, but I think God's going to continue to provide. We're adjusting our lives to it. We actually started giving in May 1% additional a month so we could turn that dial slowly. But I believe the next Sunday, when we have Commitment Sunday, and we turn in our commitment cards, if each of us have prayed and said, Lord, what does this look like for us? Then this whole project is going to be fully funded. Now, earlier in the message, I asked for $100, and Rick gave it to me. Can we thank him again? <laughs> now, you might be thinking, Rick's a pretty good guy, huh? Just giving me 100 bucks like that? Man, I just love the look of that $100 bill. <laughs> It's a real one, too. <laughs> I can confirm that Rick is absolutely a good dude, and he's generous. And you might be wondering, 
Like, why would he do that, right? Just like, came to church and the preacher dude's hitting him up. And you might be wondering, is Joe going to give that back to him? Was this just an illustration? Nope. <laughs> First of all, it's mine. No, for real. He gave it to me. Right? You don't give, and then... You can find churches that'll tell you, give to get. This is not that church. It's never going to be. I promise you it'll cost you if you do something sacrificial. And the fact that God allows you to feel that, and he's going to bless you. He is. But if you're going to give with the attitude of getting, you have mistaken what the Lord our God is calling us to. Jesus gave to give. You know what he got? He got us. I don't think he made out on that deal. <laughs> but you should also know that before the service, I gave Rick that hundred. It was mine. And then I gave it to him. And so when Rick gave me that money, he gave me what belonged to me before I gave it to him. Isn't that how giving goes? I know we're in a community where anybody who earns anything works dang hard for it. Amen? But the reality is what I'm calling you to as your pastor is to pray. And it's going to look different for every family for every individual and say, Lord, what does sacrificial look like for me? Because I'm convinced that no matter what our income is, when we actually process that, then we're going to actually experience growth as individuals and big things are going to happen as a whole church. If we play it safe, we will never experience all God has to teach us through sacrifice. Go ahead and get these communion cups, if you would, please. It's been quite a while since we've shared communion together in church. And if you didn't get one of those, let's have our uh, guest services folks. Just raise your hand, and some of our guests, our welcome team, will, will get those to you. I want you to take the, go ahead and open the little wafer part and grab that. This is just a little representation of the body of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And as you, in just a moment, as you take this and you chew this, I want you to just allow this to be a reminder that it's your sin and mine. The actions, as you chew this and break it up, it's your sin that required Jesus to make the sacrifice. And he did it willingly, not with a grudge. And as you drink the juice, consider the fact that he didn't have to, but he decided to allow himself to be poured out because he loves you. He loves you. He loves you. And as we, the church, communicate this to our community, he's going to do things beyond what we could ever produce ourselves. Thank you, Jesus, for your body given for us on the cross, that you trusted the Father all the way to the grave, that long before you carried your cross, there is a man named Abraham who is willing to lay his own son down. And now the father has allowed the actual sacrifice to happen by giving up the son for us. Thank you, Jesus, that you allowed your body to be broken for us. Thank you that you allowed your blood to be poured out as we taste and drink it in. May we drink in your mercy and your grace and may you fill us with your love for others. Jesus, we love you. 
Amen.